All right. These are my disclosures. So um, what we'll do, we'll talk about the guidelines, and I won't read every one of them, but uh, just sort of an overview. The, the remaining presenters will go in much more detail. Um, again, as I stated at the outset, we'll talk, discuss the rationale for urologists and advanced prostate cancer, and then uh, wrap up with a framework for developing a clinic according to the guidelines. So we're aware of the natural progression of prostate cancer. Fortunately, still the majority of men are diagnosed with localized disease, and those with appropriate uh, uh, management, either active surveillance or active treatment, uh, should survive uh, and, and, and be cured of their cancer. However, we know that there's a significant percentage that will progress over time, and after biochemical recurrence has run its course, uh, we then reach uh, either uh, metastatic or hormone-resistant disease. So advanced prostate cancer includes those with biochemical recurrence, those with de novo metastatic hormone sensitive, and then non-metastatic castration resistant, and finally metastatic castration resistant cancer. And the guidelines categorize each of these groups and have uh, uh, the appropriate uh, level A evidence for each one of these. So I won't, again, I won't read these, but for the patients with biochemical recurrence, the majority should be observed uh, depending on their uh, PSA doubling time. Uh, you should not routinely initiate ADT, uh, but we should use advanced imaging when available, uh, preferably including PSMA PET scanning. Um, otherwise, uh, conventional imaging with CT or MRI and bone scan can be used. For those with metastatic hormone sensitive disease, this is probably one of the more active areas of uh, clinical trials. Um, we should assess the dis extent of disease, and again, we should use advanced imaging when appropriate and available. Uh, these patients should get ADT in combination with docetaxel or oral therapy with abiraterone uh, or darolutamide based on uh, recent trials that have come out in the last couple of years. Uh, you can give chemotherapy as well, and uh, again, we'll get a full discussion of the recent PEACE-1, Aricins, and Enzymet trials as far as uh, dual versus triple therapy in this setting. In patients with non-metastatic castration-resistant cancer, uh, you can get apalutamide, darolutamide, or enzalutamide, again, based on level one evidence. And then for MCRPC, uh, we have an entire host of therapies that are available for these patients. Again, you should get appropriate imaging, and once they're stable on, on therapy, you should get imaging about every six to 12 months, along with the every other year bone density examination. Uh, in patients with uh, progression, either radiographic or uh, symptom-wise, and they previously received docetaxel, they can get lutetium-based therapy after they've gotten PSMA PET imaging. Lutetium should be considered uh, per, uh, particularly in those uh, with uh, uh, painful bony disease. Um, other therapies that are available in this space, particularly if they have previously received docetaxel, are cabazitaxel. Uh, depending on their mutational status, they can receive PARP inhibitors. Uh, you can give CPLUS-LT, particularly in patients with minimally or asymptomatic disease uh, and not rapidly progressive. And you can offer platinum-based chemotherapy in these patients. So what is the urologist's role? The rationale is that our patients know us, and we've seen them through the continuum of their disease. They had to see us at least for a biopsy, at least in the U.S., um, we may or may not have done surgery, but certainly their PSA follow-up, even if they've gotten radiation therapy. And we deal with post-therapy complications, and so the, the patients are familiar with us, we know them well, and we know the, the uh, issues that can come up along the way. And so patients do want to continue their care, uh, even if there's disease progression. And certainly, as I said, we can manage some of the complications of advanced disease. So where do the patients come from? Certainly, if you come from a large group or academic practice, you can get internal referrals. Uh, if you are known in your area as a patient who takes, uh, a person who takes care of these patients, you can certainly get external uh, referrals. You, you or an APP can perform manual chart review, but there are also uh, EMR-based uh, uh, mechanisms where you can get a prompt, and if a patient's PSA has progressed at a certain point or if they've been on ADT for a certain amount of time, you can actually get prompts from your EMR 
to say, okay, well, do they qualify for one of these uh, medications? And then you can get data analytics software, so you can get uh, information on uh, PSA, how often they've gotten any imaging, where there uh, uh, any disease that is found, and certainly if they need advanced treatment or clinical trials, you can have analytics that will identify that. Your partnerships when you create a multidisciplinary clinic should cover all of the areas where patients would receive benefit. So uh, as the lead of a multi-D group, you should certainly have familiarity and expertise uh, with the clinical guidelines as well as newer therapies. You can be a resource for APPs in your clinic uh, as well as your uh, partners in other uh, areas. Uh, the APP can be a really useful partner in this. They can follow your stable patients or even uh, see new patients. Uh, but they, they can really communicate with you, especially if they're at a different site, uh, seeing patients uh, and, and use you as a resource. Um, one of the things that we're lucky at Vanderbilt is we have a specialty pharmacy that is, is just stellar, and they can really assist you with identifying uh, funding for patients, uh, partnering with industry, uh, talking with insurance companies so you don't have to do the so-called peer-to-peer talks. Um, and uh, they, they also can assist with a lot of the drug, drug interactions that you can see. A lot of these men are older. If they're on uh, uh, blood thinners or other medications, you want to know if, if they're eligible. So uh, really a good partner with, with especially pharmacy is critical. One of the things that you and uh, the pharmacist can do is, is help mitigate financial toxicity. Um, just point out this, this report, the uh, medical student from Penn who looked at the Mark Cuban um, uh, drug cost uh, uh, website where they've actually created a way where patients can register on, on this website and all the medications that are now generic, they can order directly from them. It's called the uh, cost plus and uh, get them for significantly reduced price. And one of the medications that happens to be on it is abiraterone. So if you look at um, uh, the blue, um, the top of each bar is the cost uh, according to Medicare in 2020. You can see abiraterone is way up there. And the green part is what the cost would be comparatively uh, on the Mark Cuban Cost Plus. And for abiraterone, I mean, you can barely see the green sliver there. So it's a tremendous reduction in out-of-pocket costs for patients. And so that's one tool that you can use. So what can urologists provide? Certainly, we, we can do injectable or oral ADT. You can provide the second-line oral therapies. Um, we are a resource for Cipulus cell T immunotherapy. Uh, there are some urologists, uh, particularly in private practice, if they've uh, uh, partnered with medical oncology or just created an uh, infusion center within their practice, will give PARP inhibitors and docetaxel. Uh, however, probably the majority of this is done by medical oncology. Uh, and uh, I still advocate for surgical castration. This is the most cost effective. Um, I do capsule sparing, so they still have just a little bit of something down there. Uh, and I tell them they shrivel up anyway, so, you know, don't worry about it. So your team, uh, your APP and lead RN, especially pharmacy, you need to have access to a tumor board to discuss comp complex patients. Certainly industry partners, particularly if you're going to participate in clinical trials, and there are plenty of our uh, private and independent practitioners that do this. And then access to apheresis and or in infusion units uh, for um, Cipulus LT or some of the other therapies. Our multi-D clinic includes medical and radiation oncology, nuclear medicine, uh, especially pharmacy, as I've already mentioned. Medical genetics is helpful. Uh, we do genetic testing, and we'll, uh, we'll actually have an entire case-based uh, presentation on this. You need a location for apheresis. And then really critical is partnership with palliative care and hospice. And it doesn't necessarily have to be end-of-life care. Many of these men are dealing with several of the symptoms and side effects of medication, uh, the cost of care, uh, the effect on the family. And uh, really having your palliative care on board early on helps with goals of care. Uh, we tell our patients that there's a lot of therapies available, but sometimes the, the juice might not be necessarily worth the squeeze. And if there's goals of care that's already established, 
then uh, that conversation actually becomes a lot easier. So just to summarize, uh, patients with advanced prostate cancer have several options for care, and urologists can play an important role in providing these. A successful multidisciplinary clinic provides the best opportunity uh, for balance and management. And obviously, do not forget clinical trials for these patients, as, as we can see tremendous benefit in them. Thank you very much.